um, is, is everyone on? Uh, uh, you can sit on a camera and your microphone. Um, great. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Rethinking Economics Festival 2021 and exploration of our economic future. I am your host, Arpin Faridi. I am a PhD candidate at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, and I am a member of the Rethinking Economics India chapter. My research aims to locate shifts in work practices amongst tribal pastoralists in a state of conflict. Now on with the session. Any guarantee of a promising future cannot be made without securing the present. With workers being the backbone of any economy, prioritizing the preservation of their health should be a logical policy premise, especially during a pandemic. But has that been the case? Well, without further ado, um, I welcome our speaker, Dr. Sheetan Shabria, for this session on the political and economic impact of COVID-19. She shall attempt to unravel this postulation in her talk titled, The Health of the Economy, Dangers of Abstraction. In line with the pluralist aim of rethinking economics, the session will use the structural lens to locate pandemics. It shall allow us, it shall allow its participants and applicants to historicize and critique the economy as an abstract idea that is appealed to by ruling classes. Such a lens is useful for a holistic analysis of health policies made for the masses, the chief component of the economy. Dr. Shikul Chabria, a brief introduction about her and her work, is a historian of South Asia with a focus on locating the production of poverty and inequality. She completed her PhD at Columbia University and teaches at Connecticut College. Her first book, Making the Modern Slum, The Power of Capital in Colonial Bombay, won the American Historical Association 2020 John F. Richards Prize for, the, for South Asian History. Her current research studies the implications of caste and capital in the subcontinent's long history. Dr. Chabria's article, Manufacturing Epidemics, Pathogens, Poverty, and Public Health Crisis in India, unravels the role of colonialism in shaping the region's health infrastructure. A link to both publications will be provided in the chat. A brief note on the session plan and certain housekeeping. Uh, Dr. Sheetal will explore the theme for about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, the participants can use the Q&A tab on the right of their screen to input their question for the speakers. It would be lovely if you display your name in the questions. You can keep them anonymous, but with your names, we can allow you to come up and uh, ask the questions yourself. Uh, you can upload, upload certain questions uh, through the tabs in, in the Q&A tab. Uh, please use the chat if you face any problems and the building manager will help you out. You can also use the emojis to express yourself during the session. They are located on the bottom right uh, in yellow color. And now uh, the proverbial floor is yours, Dr. Uh, you can uh, switch on your camera and your microphone for the event, please. Uh, Dr. Shipley, you can, yes, yeah. great. Okay, great. Am I visible and audible? Okay. Thank you very much, Faridi, um, and thank you to everyone for organizing this Rethinking Economics Festival. Um, I hope that it, it really prompts a rethinking. Um, I am here sort of as an outsider. I'm not trained as an economist. I'm a historian of inequality, um, and it's pretty rare for me to get the audience of economists. Um, so I'm going, going to exploit that as much as possible. Um, I think Elizabeth has my slides, is that correct? 
Um, so you can go ahead and share the first one. I, I'm going to try to talk very briefly because I enjoy question and answer much more um, and conversation much more. I also think it's pedagogically more useful. Um, OK. So um, I'm basically going to talk about, um, ask the broad question, what does it mean to think about the health of the economy, if not to think about the health of the people in it? Um, this is a, someone said that, and I'm going to just repeat, we don't live in an economy, right? We live in a society, in a community, in families, amongst people, amongst friends. Um, so and the economy is a kind of an ab abstraction that can be historicized. Um, and um, that, that, that's sort of another project. But there's basically two parts to my presentation. One is to ask, um, how do we turn a rare illness into a pandemic? And by posing this question, I mean to um, get the audience to think about the fact that there's nothing natural about what happened or what is still happening with the pandemic. Um, there are an immense amount of human labors that make the COVID that made the COVID-19 virus into a pandemic. Um, and mainstream economists especially, and all the even more dangerous, all the media personnel who follow them, want to think of the pandemic as an exogenous shock to the system. But it's not. It's fully a result of the system, and it is caused by the very same forces inside the system that cause poverty, inequality, and illness, even illnesses that are not COVID-19. Um, so that's the first part of my presentation, which is based on this article that Friday Lee mentioned. Um, and then the second part that I'm more interested in with relation to this festival is um, I've been thinking about what is the hidden curriculum of economics. I learned about this idea of the hidden curriculum from my colleagues in uh, the education department at Connecticut College. Um, basically what it means is what are the things that are being taught that are never explicitly said? Um, so on the one hand, we have things that are taught in econ classes and then things that are criticized, um, right? We can critique things that are taught. But there's a sort of third level, which is things that are not even being critiqued, things that um, enter the conversation as the language or as a framework that becomes so naturalized, it can be very hard to think outside of them. I think this is one of the most dangerous things about um, the discipline of economics is that it really shuts down the social imagination. Um, and it does so by advancing the sort of hidden curriculum. So I'm going to speculate a little bit about what is the hidden curriculum of economics. Um, and then finally, I'm going to um, ask whether e economics can be saved, whether it can be reformed um, and whatnot, or whether it has to be abandoned, um, which is, I think, sort of a harder question than maybe has been discussed so far. Um, I think in the plenary or in the keynote, Jayati Ghosh um, said something very important, which is that economists need to return to being worldly philosophers. And I agree with that. Um, but what I don't agree with is that it mean, it doesn't mean, I think, that in every econ class, um, all the other insights of the other disciplines should be sort of taken and then used in econ classes. I actually think students should become students of other disciplines. Um, okay. So let's start with the, the pandemic. Um, sadly, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, even though the virus is somewhat new, um, the idea of a pandemic or the fact of a pandemic epidemics are not new at all. This is an image from the late 19th century, when, and there are many like it, um, when famines devastated the Indian countryside repeatedly. By the year 1900, some 30 million people had died of famine-related ca causes. Then as now, people did not get the relief they needed because ruling classes, governors of all kinds, policymakers, educators, um, everyone who was complicit in the agenda of the, the ruling classes wanted to secure the health of the economy and not the health of the people. At that time, the city was the space of the economy before the economy as such was conceived. And just as COVID is now the disease with our most immediate attention, Back then, the plague of 1896 crowded out all other illnesses. By 1921, the plague would kill 10 million people throughout India, but plague was not colonial India's only problem. Actually, you can just leave it at that slide for, for now. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I only have like five or six slides, so I'll talk over them for a while. But 
Um, plague was not colonial India's only problem. Cholera, smallpox, malaria, tuberculosis, vague fevers, and plain old starvation were constant sources of death. Between 1896 and 1921, malaria may have killed 20 million people, twice as many as the plague did in the same period. Some 12 to 20 million people perished in India during the same time. And throughout the history of British India, 23 to 35 million people died of cholera epidemics. Um, and as I said, so by 1900, 30 million people had died of what were just broadly classified as famine related causes. And all these numbers are quite likely to be underestimates because just because then, ju just as now, um, there was a difficulty in get, gaining accurate figures, and there was a lot of political motivation to under-report illness and death. Um, in the 19th century, as in the present, the eventfulness of the chosen crisis displaced attention away from long-standing structural vectors of inequality and mortality, and the force of the market, ideologically and materially, determined which events could be narrated as a crisis and which could not, and just as it determined the government's priorities in managing it. So it wasn't just that which disease was selected out um, was determined by the economic cost of that disease, but also which, um, which illness could um, warrant a um, reconstruction effort that would be profitable to the right people. That's how certain illnesses were selected out. Um, so the main insights from this article that I wrote, Manufacturing Epidemics, were threefold. One is that poverty is not an effect, but a cause of illness. Now, of course, we've learned in the past year that in India, I know, um, the rate, the number of people living under poverty has almost doubled in, in just one year. And at the same time, the, the number of billionaires in India has also grown many fold. Um, that is true, that of course, when you have such a pandemic like this, you, you produce structural inequality and poverty. But poverty is also a cause of illness. Um, it's a causal condition for much neglected endemic and epi epidemic diseases to thrive. Together, poverty, hunger, and illness are the common results of a political and economic system biased towards the more privileged in society. Therefore, sporadic crises episodes like the plague, the flu pandemic, and even COVID-19 burst onto a scene already ravaged by quieter and steadier crises of cholera, malaria, hunger, and grueling poverty. The main lesson is that pathogenic elements, bacteria, viruses, mold, fungus, parasites, all thrive in spaces of poverty. If you want to help a pathogenic element spread, design your society in such a way where you concentrate impoverished communities so that these elements can grow. And sadly, that's what we have done. So poverty is a cause, not an effect. Um, his, the reason for this is that historians have found that a key factor that accounts for India's disproportionately high rates of disease mortality is the simultane simultaneity of illness with hunger. Both cholera and influenza thrive when prolonged bouts of hunger compromise the body's defenses. Um, Mike Davis calls the synchronization between famine and disease as an ex exquisite synchronization, and it leads to a disproportionate amount of mortality and morbidity. So that's the first sort of insight, is that poverty is a cause of illness, not just an effect. The second insight, and this I think will be especially useful to people who study things like development economics, is that we have this standard story that, especially in a place like India, that the colonial regime underfunded public works, and which is why we have so much illness, and we have it till today. Um, that's certainly true, that public works were underfunded, but the colonial regime didn't act alone. Um, take, for instance, the difference in cholera rates between the cities of Bombay and Calcutta in the late 19th century. Um, the, the capital city of Calcutta, with its large population of colonial officials, constructed water supply and sewage systems, causing cholera rates to drop between 1870 and 1900. By contrast, in Bombay, when Bombay's municipal commissioner, Arthur Crawford, proposed an extensive drainage system, he was actually forced to resign after native landholders in Bombay protested against the pro proposed tax to cover the expenditures. As a result, Bombay's cholera rates remained higher than Calcutta's, and rather than share in the burden of building a public goods regime that might have mitigated 
some of the underlying causes of epidemics, the wealthy in Bombay avoided such investments, be it housing for their laborers, fair compensation for work, or sources of clean water. In some, Indian aristocrats, landlords, financiers, and industrialists did much to, de to determine state agendas, colonial or otherwise. They blocked public health when it would cost them. But there would, could be one exception to this pattern, which is if the occasion of a crisis could be made lucrative, even the moneyed classes could take interest in the health of their city, which is what happened after the plague, which is why the plague was selected. So that's the second les lesson, is that it's not when we say colonialism caused underdevelopment, that's a sort of broad shorthand that um, avoids uh, analyzing the class dynamics within India. Um, the third lesson, I suppose, of that article was that privatization kills always and everywhere. All that we imagine as the glories of developed societies are a product of social movements against private power, not a result of the growth of capital. If there is less mortality due to some diseases in the United States, for instance, versus India, it is because the United States has some semblance of a start of a public health system, Medicare and Medicaid, which certainly need to be expanded. And it doesn't have those because of the benevolence or particular insight of rulers, but because people demanded it starting in the 1920s and 1930s. Most public programs in the US, are, if not all, are a result of social agitations brought on by the Great Depression. So the COVID crisis is only the most visible one um, and governments want to invisibilize it the way they have so many silent epidemics before. In fact, um, in India, India is one of the worst places in the world to get sick. Um, what this means is that we need to put the COVID crisis and the pandemic back into its broader political economic context and see it as an endogenous result, not as an ex exogenous disruption. Um, if you could go to the next slide, Elizabeth, that'd be great. Um, all these insights are come from a wonderful piece by Neil Smith um, that's available online. Um, it's called, There's No Such Thing as a Natural Disaster. In it, he says, in every phase and aspect of a disaster, causes, vulnerability, preparedness, results and response and reconstruction, the contours of disaster and the difference between who lives and who dies is a greater or lesser, lesser extent of a social calculus. Hurricane Katrina provides the most startling confirmation of that axiom. This is what he was working on at the time. This is not simply an academic point, but a practical one. And it has everything to do with how societies prepare for and absorb natural events and how they can or should reconstruct afterward. It is difficult so soon on the heels of such an unnecessary deadly disaster to be discompassionate, but it is important in the heat of the moment to put social science to work as a counterweight to official attempts to relegate Katrina to the historical dustbin of inevitable natural disasters. And you can find the whole piece if you just Google it. It's a wonderful piece. So um, if there's no such thing as a natural disaster, we, here we have to ask ourselves, what structures of power and knowledge have I or you or each of us participated in that have breathed life into the making of, a vi of this virus more virulent. Now, sadly, economists, <laughs> sad, sad for some of us, economists hold a lot of power because the knowledge of economics is seen as technical, scientific even. Economists are positioned as experts in government, often in positions that are not elected, even in robust democracies. In fact, democracies function by having a large part of their governance personnel appointed. And so in such positions, economists have advanced some pretty murderous ideas. Um, there's really no nice way to put this. As a discipline or as, as a field, economists have mostly failed to, do, do, to work for the good of people, advance the social good, or promote justice or equality. Um, very few asks, economists even ask themselves, in whose interests am I working and why? At best, they seem to want to have the best of both worlds, how to produce a thriving economy plus take care of some people in it, right? So Neil Smith in his piece, um, and, he, and he says a lot of this too, Neil Smith in his piece argues that both in the social calculus about who lives and who dies, and in the aftermath of reconstruction, private interests domineered over public ones. And these private interests was, were supported by a large group of economists who wanted to rebuild New Orleans in ways that would make it an engine of commerce and growth. 
How many times have you heard that before? It, it is said so often, let's rebuild a place so that, ex, so that that place can become an engine of commerce and growth. It's said so often that it's almost banal, something almost any aspiring politician should say to get the votes. Um, it's this kind of this kind of thing when so when insights or assumptions of eco economics become so banalized so every day that they seep into just our normal conversation that they become very hard to combat. And so here I'm going to switch now to thinking about what how how does that happen? How do how do we um, explore or make visible the hidden curriculum of economics? Um, you can go to the next slide, Elizabeth. <clears throat> Mm, looks like my, sorry, uh, you can go up. It looks like my slides didn't come through that well. Um, what I was trying to show you, and it's not there, is just a supply and demand curve. Um, so I'll just use the supply and demand curve to see, see if we can make visible the hidden curriculum. So one of the first things one learns in, I don't know, Econ 101, um, is the supply and demand curve. And in learning it, one learns to think like an economist. In learning this, one learns about price equilibriums and movements along or changes to the curves. Um, we, we learn about what, you know, what causes the equilibrium and then what causes the curve to actually shift. Um, shifts in the curve result from uh, population changes, the improvement in technology, things like that, right? I won't review all that here. Um, and there are many criticisms of the supply and demand curve as a model of the world. In the main, the criticisms argue that it is su such a simplification to such an extent that it actually distorts our understanding of how reality works. The truth is, the critics argue, that there are no laws of supply or demand. In fact, it is people as individuals or in groups with or without power that struggle and engage in a power struggle to set prices for labor, prices for essential goods and services, and whether people get what they need. We can think of how collective bargaining increases wages, how mass attendance at municipal meetings and public hearings can forestall the privatization of clean water, public schools, roadways, etc. So this, these are all the sort of good things that can happen because people use collective power. But there's also collective power on, on, on the bad side, right? Some people can use their power, if they have a lot of it, to crowd out competitors through recourse to international law or by making patents on everyday objects like agricultural, agricultural seeds, um, vaccines, and numerous other methods of manufacturing demand. So in short, it is people caught in power struggles with one another that determines how stuff is allocated or misallocated across the world. The word law, law of supply and demand, or law of supply and the law of demand, as if supply and demand were working by some invisible force of nature, um, or the invisible hand hides this power struggle and it makes it seem like some natural outcome. But all of this, basically the criticism of the work that the law of supply and demand does, um, is just a criticism of the supply and demand curve. What we haven't yet gotten to is a revelation of the hidden curriculum of being taught this. Um, so the hidden curriculum is what is so deeply assumed, often both by the initial curriculum and its criticism, that it sets the terms for debate. And, setting the, and in setting the terms for debate has inadvertently, in the most covert fashion, established itself as an incontestable fact. So here are some of the things I speculated on that are the hidden content of this curriculum, and we could, in our conversation, come up with more. So one of the things that happens when we teach the supply and demand curve, and maybe even we're good people and we teach the criticism of it, one of the things that happens is that things, stuff, become the main object of inquiry. How much things cost, how much of it there can be. This is basically an act of displacing people. One learns early on in the first days of econ class to substitute for conversations about people, their experience and, and their lives, conversations about things. And I think in this way, it, it's quite damaging. You, young people walk into these classes and they immediately start to feel that instead of talking about people's experiences, what they actually should be talking about, the things in the world. That's one thing. The second thing that is sort of incontestable and true um, when we advance, when, when we leave the hidden curriculum intact is that all value is to be represented, translated, and so fundamentally is money value or monetary value. 
we are taught early on that value is nothing more than that. Uh, many students forget very easily that value means something much more profound than this. What is valuable to us is actually a very deep question, one that humans should be having much bigger conversations about. A third thing that, that happens is that the underlying assumption is that people's behavior can be understood as everybody having a maximizing impulse. And by maximizing impulse, I mean trying to get the most for less. Um, that, and, and so we end up learning that maximizing is in fact human nature, that everybody does it, when in fact that's not true. Sometimes we actually um, give up a lot for very little. Um, and I can think of tons of examples like that, but I won't go into them now. Um, another part of the hidden curriculum is that, and this is probably quite damaging, is that there is an economy out there. There's such a thing as an economy. In the way that there are laws of therm thermodynamics that explain our physical world, there are laws of the economy that explain the economy, right? And that whole thing is a, is a tautology because there might not be an economy. There, that actually might be a completely fictitious idea. Um, and then the final thing that one learns um, is that one can have mastery over the world if one learns some formulas or some, some computations, right? And what does it mean to have mastery? It means to position oneself as above and apart from the object one studies, rather than alongside, in solidarity with, or even victimized by. So at the very outset, one learns, one aspires to that kind of mastery of the world. Um, and the formulas and, and graphs and things like that give us that illusion of having that kind of mastery. But it's also not just an illusion. Increasingly, people come to not see their struggle as related to the struggles of others. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Hopefully it came through. So I'm just going to, I'm going to say a few more things, but mainly I'm going to leave, this is a piece by Timothy Mitchell, Fixing the Economy, which I really think, I'm actually shocked that more, more econ curricula do not assign this piece. Um, it's, it's a historicization of this idea of the economy, and I think it's very useful. And it might not be entirely correct, but we don't have enough people even debating it. Um, I'm just going to leave that there but it's, and, and talk about something else, which is what has been basically the aftermath of the COVID pandemic? Um, one, as I said earlier, in India, poverty rates have doubled, and there are also more billionaires than ever. We now live in, in a very obscene world. <laughs> Um, it was already obscene before, but it's now more obscene that the news media um, covers uh, the wealthy people's, you know, joy rides to the moon or wherever they're going while the pandemic is happening. In fact, if you had written that, if you had said that's what's going to happen in the year 2021, and you were writing in 1990, people would have said that's absurd. We would never let that happen. But we have, in fact, let that happen. Um, so that's one of the aftermaths. Um, but in spite of the fact that this sort of obscenity and absurdity has happened and the economy has slowed overall, none of it really matters. Because the truth of the matter is that the baseline of the conversation has moved rightwards. It seems now that in India, I can say, no one seems to dare question or suggest that India should not return to a path of aggressive GDP growth. Or no one seems to ask whether we should be criminalizing all private healthcare providers and suppliers. I personally think that would be a good conversation to have, and I would probably be on board. Um, I, do, I don't know why somebody's health should be profitable for another person. It doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Um, we also not having a conversation about in establishing and even enforcing a true minimum wage, um, a livable wage. Um, there's not a conversation about whether we should expand Nerega so much, in fact, expand it so very much to the point that laborers turn down exploitative work and debt bondage. That would be one way to solve India's um, laboring poor um, problems, right? Um, we don't seem to be having a conversation about whether we can use the government to compete with rather than aid private interests. Um, and then, you know, in this festival, this has happened, we've talked in the last session, especially, there was a good conversation about how limiting GDP measurements are. But we still don't have um, a agreed upon set of metrics that would displace GDP, given that we know that GDP measurements don't measure the, you know, good in any way. Um, 
So even before the pandemic, but especially now, India has the largest, and I focus on India just because that's my side of research, but India has the largest number of undernourished people in the world. And that, that problem has grown. Malnourishment is India's silent emergency with higher child mal malnourishment rates than in Sub-Saharan Africa and five times as much as in China. TB claims the highest number of lives in India. One fifth of maternal deaths and one quarter of child deaths in the world occurs in India. Amongst children under five, India has the highest mortality rates worldwide. India spends less than one and a half percent of its GDP on health, which is one of the lowest in the world, even amongst developing countries. A large part of um, the reason this is, is because in India, they have accepted, people have accepted that India is a developing country and so needs to advance private interests so much in order to finally develop. But we've been waiting decades for that, that horizon of development to finally occur. Um, and this kind of economistic thinking has been so generalized across the population that it becomes very hard to even begin a conversation and debate about it. Um, I'm just going to leave you with one last um, remark, which I, I'm going to say, and it, I invite debate even about it, but um, I think one of the saddest things I see that has happened is that there's a sort of expert knowledge that's created, especially in economics, but you, you, I mean, this, you know, there are other disciplines that do this. Um, and what happens with that is that the insights of the laboring classes and the poor are completely dismissed. Um, in the past several years, hundreds of thousands of workers across India have gone on strike. Um, and most of the time, they demand basically basic things, uh, price floors, higher wages, loan waivers, pensions, compensation for farmer suicides, and better working conditions. And these strikes basically reveal an imminent critique of what we call the economy. In other words, working people are not confused about what causes impoverishment. They can identify rigged policies and government neglect, and they fully understand how markets work. In, in, in some ways, they understand it better than those of us who learn it from a book. They know the cruelty of the fact that if they are too industrious, for example, yield too many potatoes one year, prices of their potatoes will fall. So a particularly labor-intensive season with great yield won't correspond to greater income. Instead, a crisis of overproduction is just as likely. Um, this insight that efficient, what economists might call efficiency, driving prices down, making more with less, and by driving prices down, we mean even driving labor and costs down, um, is not really a starting point for criticism of economics, even within the discipline, right? It's, um, and yet working classes who protest against the collusions and collaborations of capital um, understand it very well. Um, but we don't take that as a starting point, we as scholars, right? Um, so while the poor can grasp what we call the falling rate of profit, the compulsory nature of the race to the bottom, and the simple fact that hard work does not equal higher pay, economists, technocrats, politicians, and their public relations practitioners across the media insist on confusing matters. And this mystification of the problem before us not only has colonial origins, but it also belies the ongoing unequal relationships through which economic knowledge is created. Relationships that position experts on top of people who become mere data sets in the production of theory. Um, and, and especially when it comes to development economics, it's often thought that poverty in the global south is categorically distinct kind of poverty. It's different than poverty in the global north. But this is also, I think, not true. Um, poverty in the global south is just a sort of, not a different kind, but it's the same kind, just of an extent that's much worse. Um, this, this quote is, um, it doesn't say the dates, oh no, it does. Um, it, Timothy Mitchell basically argued something similar, which is that starting in the 1930s, because of the way in which the science of economics dis, um, developed, it's, it helped to mystify and obscure the origins of our, of our problems rather than shed a light on them. Um, and to do the work, I think, of um, dismantling that, getting revealing the hidden curriculum, should, trying to imagine what other things are possible, we might have to ask ourselves the sort of difficult question that I said I would end with, which is, 
can the discipline of economics be reformed or do we really need to abandon it and start start over start with some new kind of um, enterprise that uses knowledge to advance the public good um, I'm, I tend to think the latter um, but I'm open to you know being debated I guess um, I'll stop there and I look forward to your comments and questions Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Smith, for an amazing presentation. Um, I mean, uh, I just want to compliment you and impress upon our speakers. Uh, essentially, your presentation, the way you use methodology and methods to combine both uh, historical as well as economic analysis uh, to gently critique, uh, I mean, uh, methodological individualism, that was lovely, and how you eschewed the use of jargon and just made it very simple. I really like that. And I think now uh, I would like to uh, uh, let's head on to the Q&A session and invite Kelly uh, Roya for the question. Can, can they be brought forward? Can they switch on their microphone? and ask the question directly. Uh, Kelly Roy, uh, uh, Roy, sorry, uh, uh, you can message Elizabeth. Want to ask your question directly, that would be nice. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think that is uh, in the core of everything in economics festival. Uh, because uh, it responds to a lot of my concerns through my studies in economics so far. And the question has to do that OCB is not an appropriate uh, measure well-being so i would like to know if a combination of um, capabilities approach of amartya sen and nussbaum uh, and human rights can replace the use of gdp thank you very much would you like me to respond to each question Frank? yeah okay um so I think there's many things that could replace GDP. Um, we could also just come up, I mean, there are indices like the Gini coefficient um, for inequality. Um, we could look at the, I mean, this was discussed really well by Kate Raworth in her um, book, Donut Economics, and she was speaking in the session prior to this one. I thought that was very good. Um, we could also just take other indices and subtract them from GDP. Um, as you all know, you can, you can destroy the planet, engage in war, do all sorts of awful things to raise your GDP, right? So maybe places with lower GDP are doing better. Um, that, that's all one aspect of it. But um, I'm, I have to say, when, we, when I look at places that are quote unquote poor countries um, or poor that are doing well. In fact, I think one of the things that was revealed so clearly after the pandemic was that being a rich country did not make one immune to the problems of the pandemic. In fact, the US and the UK um, suffered a lot and are still suffering, right? Um, and that's because it's not a simple um, question of having aggregate wealth that can solve your problems. The, the question of what can solve your problems is a political question. It's a question about how you allocate resources and power and to whom and to what end. Um, so GDP doesn't capture any of that. Um, unfortunately, I think there are entities, I mean, we can sit here, it's, it's almost an idle conversation to sit here and say, we should get rid of GDP. Well, there's lots of institutions that, um, I mean, the reason India pursues GDP is because that's, that's the index that's watched by the World Bank and by the IMF and by investors and, and they're the ones who are trying to make sure that you know India's GDP is growing for the investor class. So I think we have a lot more work to do than to just say let's abandon GDP. We need to look at for what is it working. 
Um, I've asked a hundred times, I've asked economists, like how, how is GDP measured? And there is some simple formula, but it turns out that the actual way it's measured is something much more complicated because of course it's an aggregate, right? You can't go around and ask everybody what they did. Um, so it's a, such a distortion um, that, and, and people on the outside like me, I'm a historian, critiquing GDP is not gonna work. I think economists should come out roundly in a chorus and say, this is a total bullshit measure. And we, we have to completely stop using it. Um, that there are plenty of us on the outside of economics waiting for those of you on the inside to start saying the things that we've been saying for a long time. Um, and, and sadly, because, I mean, for whatever reason, nobody thinks a historian or a sociologist has that much insight onto these things, right? But they do. Um, but the economists have the power. And if economists, and you have to do a lot of organizing within your discipline, which is you know, what this festival is about, but do a lot of organizing within your discipline to really start dismantling um, all this mystification that has happened around, I don't know, human livelihood. Um, ultimately, what we all want is the same, as we want to be able to live freely with happiness amongst people that we love. Um, and it just, it's just, it's not that hard to get there if, if we get the uh, measurements right, right? But thank you for your question. Thank you very much. Uh, in uh, just an anecdote, so in in, uh, in context of economic theory and learning and curriculum, during my research work, my advisor direct, directly advised us that it is you privileged lot who need to learn economic theory. People on the street bargaining for their rights, they don't need to be taught any form of this theory. So uh, let's head on to question number two by Chima uh, Rickards. Would you please turn on your camera and microphone? Can you hear me? All right. Okay. So just to give a bit of context behind my question, given that aspects of economic thought are already entrenched in our social structure. So like when you mentioned the hidden um, curriculum, for example, a lot of these things that people don't even question at all. It's just um, like a stylized fact. Um, and bearing in mind that like when we look at mainstream economics, for example, aspects of it uh, have already been shown to be um, invalid or incorrect or just irrelevant. So um, a, a simple example would be the concept of complete self-interest, right? There have been studies that show that um, human beings have a leaning towards altruism in one form or the other. So my question, and it, it may be too big a question, but it's more like if there are suggestions, um, how can we shift economics both as an academic discipline, but also even though it's technically made up, it's still a key part of global structures towards an epistemology that is actually really improving global living standards and progressing society, I guess, in, in a positive way. Um, yeah, that's my question. Um, so there's no way to, for me to answer this question in a dishonest way. So I have to be brutally honest. Um, I am not sure we can improve economics. Um, I actually don't think we can. I think the discipline has methods and assumptions that come out of colonization paradigms. And by colonization, I do not mean the West upon the rest. I mean, economics or what became economics was always um, a set of I don't know, axioms and theories that were produced by observing people from a distance and striving even in the colonial era to improve towards improvement. That is how to get the land to make more, um, how to motivate poor people to work, <laughs> how to um, sort of maximize, right? Maximize what we can make out of things. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I guess I'm, I'm gonna ask you a question back, which is, <laughs> I will lose a lot of friends here, but what is, give, tell me one insight into human nature or the human condition or society that economists have offered that is not derivative from some other discipline 
or um, right? I mean, what is the one positive contribution that the history of economics has ever offered in society? I actually can't think of a single one. Um, this morning, uh, again, I just have to be honest, that's the only way I can be. Um, Jayathi Ghosh in her plenary mentioned um, Raj Chetty's work on how he shows that um, where you are born determines your life outcomes. That's a widely known thing that where you were born, I mean, who would have thought otherwise that where you were born wouldn't affect life outcomes? The counterfactual is so absurd, right? As if one could be born anywhere <laughs> and um, it would make no difference. Um, so I'm not convinced that there's, I mean, and, and even if he did advance that insight, um, it's a sociological correlation. It has very little to do with economics. Um, right? There's, there's really nothing economistic about it. Um, so one thing I've been quite disturbed by is the way in which within the discipline of economics, there's been this proliferation of subfields, um, health economics, environmental economics, race and gender economics. It's as if economists want to just absorb all the other things and say, we're going to do it and we're going to do it better. When instead what needs to happen is economists need to return to their social scientific and humanistic roots and say, how can I become a student of the world again? Which means I'd, I start reading things produced by sociologists, anthropologists, historians, literature. I mean, what I'm reading right now, um, The Parable of the Sowers by Octavia Butler, and it's a profoundly insightful book. Um, and I didn't say, oh, this is literature, so I'm just going to put it into my imagination and not have it affect me in any way, right? So whether economics as an academic discipline can be improved, um, I'm actually not sure. I don't know that we need another new formula or another new calculation <laughs> at all. Uh, uh, in, in, in this context, uh, I mean, uh, it just is waiting there to be asked, what do you think of this decolonizing paradigm that is being pushed in universities right now, do you think that offers any hope for the subject or the academic discipline as it sounds right now? Um, I was very impressed by Kate Raworth's insights and, and criticism of GDP and growth, okay? What she said, though, had nothing to do with decolonizing. Unfortunately, a lot of what decolonizing means in an academic discipline often just means let's introduce, let's bring into the same conversation women, people from the global south, people of color. Um, there are plenty of people of color. There are plenty of my people in India who are awful enterprising economists. I mean, Raj Chetty is, you know, the RCT people are all Indian economists. So I'm not sure that changing the cosmetic makeup of the conversation is going to do much. Decolonization, by the way, too, is an actual material practice on the ground. It's not something that can happen in our heads. Um, we can try to advance knowledge that would help do that, and we need to think hard about us as intellectuals. What do we contribute? Uh, I think you asked this question, Farid, at one of the earlier suggest uh, sessions. If there's a social movement or protest or somebody's trying to dismantle something, what can we do in solidarity with them? Well, that's a good question. What can we do? One of the things that we shouldn't do is be like, well, they just, they're just people doing their thing. Let me come up with the theory. In fact, the best theory comes from people on the ground who can see clearly how stuff is you know, ruining their lives. Um, so shifting economics, I don't know. I mean, I'm still waiting for someone, for someone from the audience to get upset with me and say, no, this is the insight that economists have offered. Um, you know? May I? Sure, yeah. Person who asked the question. Um, so I, I do agree with much of what you said, especially looking at the idea that Econs has drawn on a lot of other disciplines, but still engages in <coughs> gatekeeping as opposed to interdisciplinary work um, from like sociology and anthropology and the like. But maybe perhaps when you're looking at um, how one defines economics to, to varying degrees, one aspect when it comes to resource allocation or optimizing like personal utility for an <coughs> microeconomics offers, I, I, I would dare say that economics, maybe this is a biased perspective as an econ student myself, does have something to offer 
but reframing how we evaluate and view these things moving forward, um, maybe definitely that needs some radical restructuring. But but I, I, I would dare to argue that Econs does have something to, to, to offer for sure. Um, it's just maybe in its current form failing in, in what it could give our society. Um, yeah. Um, optimizing, I mean, I, I'm trying to just follow what you were saying, but you basically mean the insight that people optimize their resources, that that's an insight that's useful. Is that right? Yeah, like the idea of, of resource allocation, <coughs> whether you're looking at it from an individual level um, or, sorry, or looking at it from an, uh, an organizational level or looking at it from a governmental level, um, that is something that, for example, cost benefits analysis can, can be come from economics and, and, and usually can be quite useful and helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess what I would argue against this, I mean, maybe that's true, but I'm just going to say, like, I have an eight year old and it is incredibly cost inefficient, the amount of energy I put into her. Um, she is probably not going to remember a lot of stuff that happened in her childhood. Um, and she is eager to get ahead in the world and like move on and make her life, right? But um, here I am pouring all these resources into her so much. I mean, even the public school system is at a cost. It's not actually efficient. Um, and so the question of resource allocation and how to maximize like cost benefit, I mean, I don't think that we do that in all the things that matter in our life. We actually, this is why I mentioned the thing about value. Like what is valuable to us is actually quite cost ineffective. Um, we're not efficient when, when it comes to doing the things that are valuable to us. Um, yeah. Okay, um, I'll, I'll stop there because maybe it could go back and, back and forth and I, and I don't want to disrupt other people's questions, but thank you so much. Um, for the thoughts you provided. It's much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Tina. Uh, uh, I would like to move on to the next question. Uh, Kabilan, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? Thank you. Um, hi, uh, thank you. And my question is, again, uh, as a historian, you might have seen uh, lots of uh, um, the influence of pandemic and everything. And uh, actually, uh, I like in order to um, rectify what all the mistakes might have happened. So is it uh, because of uh, affordability of preventive healthcare measures like uh, a good nutritious food or something like that because for that we need a different strategy like uh, improving the income of the people but in other things like infrastructure there should be like a huge public expenditure to be made in order to gain so uh, there are different perspectives on different types of approaches should be taken so uh, what do you think uh, is better yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> in, in the piece, Manufacturing Epidemics, that I wrote, it was all about advocating for preventive public health measures. Even in the US, where I'm located right now, um, public health is always under assault, right? Things are not, if, if projects of public health are not remunerative for private interests, then they take a lot more work to create. Um, screenings for illnesses, um, like you said, nutritious food, food should not be commodified to the extent that it is, um, or even at all. Um, you could even just read the journalist Synots, everybody loves a good drought, read the section, the chapter on health. It's pretty damning. We have numerous public health centers all across the country, and most of them are completely underfunded, run by quacks, um, and just do not really help people. But if you actually wanted a healthy population, you would, like you said, have to invest so much. Um, and even this idea that we have to invest so much, it's a fraction of what we spend on the army, of what we spend on all sorts of things that help nobody. I mean, I was really struck during the pandemic of what all the soldiers must be doing since there's no war to fight and they're, right, they're just sitting idle, nothing to do. Um, and yet we couldn't mobilize that sort of human resource to, for the public good. 
Um, I mean, and it would have been bad in some ways, had we, but there are, there's a huge, huge misallocation of resources. This is why I'm very resistant to the idea that economics is about allocation of resources or maximal allocation of resources. If you actually just, you know, just be completely honest with yourself and take stock of the allocation of resources in the world, in India, huge misallocation. There's so many people willing to work for, for the good and not get, being given a job. <laughs> Um, and yet we're rewarding destructive sociopathic tendencies, right? So yeah, I think it would take a huge kind of investment and, and it wouldn't be so costly. It, it would just mean redirecting some of the money we already spend in India on nonsense. Um, yeah. Like uh, I, I had, sorry, I'll continue. Like uh, we had courses like, uh, in Gottingen University, we have some courses on economics of health. And uh, even in that, it was given like uh, having a good doctor and uh, not having a better transport facility also will lead to a disaster and uh, even vice versa. So I think uh, even like it, it should be a very big push, you know, like for uh, everything altogether should be developed and uh, maybe that might turn good. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, this is an interesting quip on like about this notion of why do soldiers exist? I mean, I don't know if people know, but since World War Two, uh, the United States has always been at a constant state of war with some country or the other in the world, and that is the reason which fuels their defense uh, industry and that uh, and such allocation, reallocation of resources is said to be the cause of this like the so-called US economy jumping back after the two, 2008 recession. Uh, uh, next question, uh, I would like uh, Emma to come up and uh, I think this question is very important. And yeah, having Dr. Sheetal here would be very interesting since she comes from a discipline which she claims to be outside economy. Emma, please uh, unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? everyone good okay um yeah so uh as a non-economist i'm not an econ student i'm uh going into public policy hopefully i know like why am i here um but um i assume with public policy i will have to work a lot with economists um and do you have advice for critically engaging with economists and the whole field of economics when you're not really trained in that um and just how have you been able to do it um, I don't have good advice for you, but I think mostly I've been unsuccessful. Um, thanks to Furry, the I'm here today, somehow he found me. Um, but economists are really an insular bunch. Um, as a historian, I read anthropologists, I read sociologists, I even read economists sometimes. Um, I read literature, I read all sorts of things, but economists are they tend not to, they tend to reinvent the wheel and do some study that discovers what a lot of us already knew, right? Um, and so I don't, I mean, unfortunately there's like lingo one has to learn. Um, I think th this is the reason I talk about the supply and demand thing is just to like say to the economist, look, I understand how supply and demand works. I understand your model and I think it's dumb. So here, you know, <laughs> but you have to sort of do that. You have to say, I'm going to take the terms of your debate and then I'm going to show you. And, and that's a tiresome, tiresome task. Um, I think the bigger goal of, that would be a good goal is to, and I'm, I'm sorry to have to say this, but I think economists should be in the public discourse, their expertise needs to be challenged so much. The notion, I mean, I, I'll never forget my disappointment when Barack Obama was elected in the US in 08. And he was like, you know, the first black man to be president and whatnot. And he appointed Timothy Geithner um, to solve the housing problem. The man who created the problem was appointed to solve the problem. And, and Obama said, basically, I know I understand a lot of things, but I don't understand economics. And so I'm going to appoint the expert to help me. That is not right. I think we all need to exercise our economic citizenship and we need to um, learn about the economy, even if as it is as fictitious as it is, um, and participate in those conversations um, and not just farm it out to experts. Um, 
So this is a multi-pronged approach, working with non-economists to give them economic literacy so that we can be informed citizens, um, economic citizens, but also working with economists to say, let me show you that your expertise is on thin, you know, thin ice here. And, and that, you know, you, you shouldn't be claiming so much mastery of the world. You, you don't have it. Um, so I don't know. I would love to hear if anybody else has suggestions. I actually don't know. <laughs> I, I, I mean, uh, if I may just comment on this, I mean, since even I come from outside the discipline is that academic curricula is so hellbent in creating specializations and you know uh, intellectuals which uh, which usually try to abstract knowledge production wherein our own lived experiences which might uh, help us understand the so called economic models or economic exchange basically resource management that is excluded from everyday curricula that we sort of become insecure even in stepping into fields which should be very organic and hence the constant compartmentalization so uh emma all the best to you <laughs> and if, if you want to make any final statement or all right all right so moving on to uh, uh the next question i think this was covered before uh, the question was is by an anonymous person is there any substantial reason why only one percent of gdp is contributed to health in india uh, I think you hinted this at how power structures determine uh, allocation of resources. Uh, so that would be the reason and the best way to challenge that is uh, through social mobilization and political mobilization. Uh, coming to the next question by Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin, would you like to come up and ask your question? Benjamin, please unmute yourself using the mic icon at the bottom of the screen. Yeah. So I'm not an economist. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a digital technology guy. Yes, I agree with a lot of your points that I've always argued, but it's, it's like a mad person arguing. But I also believe like statistics within economics can help. Um, however, my question to you is, with all you've said, do you think, is there any existing political economic uh, model for any society around the world right now that is um, enviable or that we can copy? I mean, look at China is saying, I took, I, I picked, now there are something million people out of poverty. I mean, yes, they are communists. Could, do they have any model we could copy that could go for other part of the world? That's my question to you. Irrespective of the economics that is within them or model they use, as long as, if it's true, that they get more people to a decent living standard. Thank you. Um. I mean, there are plenty of places in the world that are worth emulating. I don't know what you mean by manageable. I suppose you mean, are we able to do those things? I mean, in the beginning of the pandemic, I know in India, Kerala was exceptionally do, you know, doing an exceptionally good job. And it's because they have a huge public distribution system, a huge army of healthcare workers. Um, they're not raising a standing army. Um, they are their priorities seem to be correct, right? The, the, the goals that they want in their society are the ones that most people want when you ask them. Um, this is also true, and I know in Vietnam they were doing better. Um, there, It's shocking actually that this insight hasn't been um, said more loudly in the world, which is that it wasn't the richest countries in the world that overcame the pandemic. It was actually poorer places that set their priorities straight. In the US, the only plan we had was the vaccine. But actually, if everyone wore a mask and we shut down everything, maybe but the schools or something, like we could have stopped this thing much earlier. Um, I always tell my students this, some of the biggest problems in the world, they, they, they're big problems, but they're really not that hard to, um, there's a way in which scholars and academics and whatnot mystify those problems and they make it seem much more complicated. 
They're just not that complicated. It's just that we lack the political will to make it happen. And even if we do have the political will, there are forces and powers that be that, that silence our voices. Um, so I do think there are places in the world that are doing much better and they're usually not on the news. Um, now, dare I say Cuba exports doctors, <laughs> exports nurses. Uh, why isn't, I mean, what else are we producing if we're not producing people who can take care of the health of each other? What other nonsense are we producing, right? And somehow there, and, and somehow, so there are places that are worth emulating and, and doing it right. But the news media especially is, I mean, journalists have a lot of, um, as a profession, just been assaulted, I think, but also have a lot of work to do in thinking about whose stories do they tell. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. That's um, uh, Vinayakan, would you like to ask a question, please? Benjamin, uh, please. Yeah, great. Uh, then I can. Then I can use the center below button to unmute yourself, please. I would like to ask regarding the mention of economists uh, specializing in the various fields like ecological economics uh, and sort of things. Um, does that mean that economics has uh, solutions for all those uh, problems addressed, uh, like uh, faced in th those areas? Can we say like that? Uh, could we could we think like that? Uh, or should, should could could we critically consider uh, like uh, them moving to those fields as something? Uh, which need not happen. Um, I, let me see if I understand correctly, but I guess I'm looking for someone to tell me what an ecological economist offers, um, because I don't get it. A health economist, what, what, what is the insight that they're bringing that, I, that someone who's not an economist couldn't figure out? Um, and this is not to criticize people. It's to criticize the methods and the um, the call to knowledge production within the discipline and how that's framed. Um, because a lot of that is also just driven by professional um, self-interest, right? Like I need to carve out a field for myself and make myself somehow the expert on something. Um, and that's really the truth of a lot of what drives academic production is that it's a lot of professional self-interest. Um, and that is also, again, I could say uh, compassionately, not the fault of individual people, but of the fault of the fact that the education industry has turned into an industry in which everybody needs to be an entrepreneurial intellectual rather than somebody that says, you know what, I have nothing new to offer. I just have um, basically going to tell you the same old stuff that we've always been worried about, which is we need to think about equality, how to redistribute things, how to get the people who are sociopathic assholes out of power, um, you know, basic stuff, right? But everyone's got to have some sort of entrepreneurial, sort of intellectual selfhood um, in, the, in, in the industry. I'm very privileged that I'm tenured at an institution that I can now say this kind of thing, right? Um, but not everybody can. Um, I also just want to say in relation to that last question, um, on Thursday, I believe you're having Aparna Gopalan speak on Thursday about, and she's going to talk about Kerala and what Kerala did. So in, insofar as thinking about like, well, what, um, what is worth emulating? What is wor good that's worth doing? Well, there are, you know, there are people who study that and who can offer some insight. And I, I believe it's on Thursday, um, that, that talk. But I don't know if I've answered your question, but I can. But yeah you really answer like till uh, is today also i was googling today was world like a, a conservation day and like i was googling for conservation economics and uh, finding articles regarding that like you really made me rethink from that perspective thank you so much and i'm from kerala only thank you okay. for mentioning our progress thank you Bye. yeah yeah it, i'll just say about that you know conservation eco economics if you're interested in conservation what are the better things you could read because that's such a new field in economics, why would we start there? In fact, there have been people who have talked about the environment and ecology that have gone down it from different disciplines. Forget about the discipline. The disciplines are artificial anyway, right? They don't matter. 
Um, you're interested, fun, I mean, this is what Faridi said, is how do we reconnect to our lived experience? We all have this lived experience that the world is unsustainable as it is. Okay, so now what's my question about it and what are the books I can read and have no regard for what discipline that person comes from? Um, I think that's the way to go. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, I think this new, uh, this new field of, I don't know if it's new or not, but this notion of conservation historically has been very problematic, especially in its scientific origins because colonialism essentially began with conservation practices to grab forest resources and they primarily primarily used to conserve by kicking out the natives from the region so i would be a bit cautious in going headlong into conservative conservation economics uh the last question i see in the chat after which i will ask a question or two i've been very patient uh, uh, this is an anonymous question. So the question is, how do we recenter economics back onto the people and not things? What are some ways to challenge this? Um, again, I'm going to answer, how do we recenter economics back on people, not things? I'm going to say, let's not recenter economics. Let's just start thinking about people and things and, and, and not things and think about lived experiences. What are the pro I always, I think if you truly want to be interdisciplinary or anti-disciplinary, you begin by asking yourself, what's my question in the world? So my question in the world is why is there inequality every day after every day? How come it never goes away, <laughs> right? So basically I'm asking what are the structures that reproduce it? Um, and then in order to understand that, I would read anything that would help me understand that. Um, whether it came out of sociology, philosophy, literature, economics, um, everything, right? Um, so I think, and I mean, I, I think that's the way any thinking person ought to begin is to just say, well, what's my question? And then what are the possible answers that have been given? Another fact would be to look at, um, you know, what, what has the history of each discipline done to distort that? Um, some of the other things that are in the sort of hidden curriculum of economics that I didn't talk about were when we start learning about developed and developed developing countries or even things like GDP, what is assumed is that the nation is the unit of analysis, right? I mean, that is, that's sort of the hidden curriculum is that now everyone's starting to be schooled in the fact that we live in nations. Uh, that's wrong. When we learn about inflation, we, what, that's, what's the hidden curriculum there? The hidden curriculum is right away you are put into alliance with the ruling classes, the governing classes, because you start to look at inflation as a sort of problem of monetary management. Whereas if you are a working class poor person, especially in India, and you're under so much debt, inflation is a wonderful thing because you now owe less than, than you know, I mean, it's also very bad. Um, but, you know, so I don't know that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in economics. I, it, you know, and part of that, that much of that work is going to have to come from the outside. So what I would I, honestly, I guess if there was one takeaway I could say is every one of you go back to your departments and say our curriculum should demand that our students take classes outside of econ uh, within the social sciences, within the hum humanities, and that should be a part of getting the bachelor's degree, the master's degree or the PhD. There should not be this silo of students just take econ classes and keep doing that again and again. Uh, I would like to add to that question and maybe like since you consider yourself as a historian by training, how do you think history benefits uh, this current economic discipline? How can economists use history to further their goals in making this a more inclusive subject? What has been your experience? Um, I think the most powerful thing about history is the act of historicization. That is taking something that looks natural and normal and saying actually it occurred in a specific time and place because of specific powers that be and because of specific um, struggles that were sorted out in the following manner. And so once you denaturalize something, that actually is an imagination opening exercise because now you can imagine other worlds. 
and and you can imagine different ways of being in the world because and you don't have to just it's not science fiction it's we used to be different right there was a time when nations were not normal there was a time when gdp was not a thing there was a time when um driving the cost of labor down to into the ground was not the goal of every thinking person um right there was a time when there was no minimum wage there was a right there was an, in, in the US, we benefit from there being some sort of minimum wage, but there was a time where there was no minimum wage. And at that time, life in the United States of America looked a lot like a developing country. Um, so there, that act of historicization, I think is incredibly powerful. Um, I'll just, I won't go into this, but I'll just say, of course, every discipline has, once, I critique history as well. History has often done, historians have often done the work of the nation state. Um, so every dis no discipline is pure and good. Every discipline has its colonial roots and it has its decolonial roots or anti-colonial roots. And you have to engage with the d debates inside that discipline um, rather than reify it. Um, and, and then you can come up with something. But I mean, like, the most important thing to, I'll just go back to your lived experience thing. And in our gut, I really believe that we, most of us have a sense of what is right and wrong and we know what's worth doing and what's not. So somehow the education system is designed to alienate you from your gut instincts, but you need to like hold on tight to that gut instinct and um, make sure that you use your education for what you want to do rather than the education using you for what it wants to do. Uh, uh, before I ask my question, it's my responsibility. I would like to call uh, No Haila to ask the question, and I apologize beforehand if I mispronounce any of the names. So uh, <laughs> please unmute yourself. Now Haila. Uh, please look to the bottom center of your screen. You will see an icon for mic. Please press that and ask your question. Ah, uh, Elizabeth uh, saying that she probably left. So I would ask the question. Let's not leave that. Uh, the question is, do you think that a change of paradigm in economics should necessarily be accompanied with a change in the geopolitical paradigm to be truly effective? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, the geopolitical paradigm and geopolitics um, needs to be changed drastically. I mean, nothing should be remain as is. So I don't, I mean, I guess that's my short answer, yeah. but I'm not mm -hmm. sure I fully understand the question, I'm sorry. Um, I think yeah, there there was a hint at basically wondering. I had an echo. Yep, this seems good. I think there was an implicit uh, question about whether current power relations need to be changed before. Uh, uh, they can be a shift in the academic paradigm. Um, yeah, I think now I will ask a question. Uh, and, <laughs> so, uh, but I will thank all the participants for the question. So, uh, my question to you is: uh, Do you think these health crises, especially which involve regulation of mobility, have been used um, as a tool of biopower uh, historically and which continue to do now. Is there some colonial uh, colonial authoritarian strain in this? And maybe also, uh, I was wondering about this notion, this constant use of this word herd immunity vis-a-vis -vis pandemic. How is it being operationalized? Is it another like sense of uh, basically pushing all the responsibility onto the patient, the victim? Um, so the first question, uh, absolutely, health crises um, 
back in the 19th century and even now are used as opportunities. You know, there's people who say never let a good crisis go to waste, um, but they're used as opportunities to reconfigure the relationships between objects and things, uh, objects and things and people. Um, and they're used to manage populations, to decide who counts and who doesn't, to um, reduce um, expectations. This is, I think, one of the ways in which the conversation has moved to the right in this past year, um, is that our expectations are now much lower about what is normal um, and what, you know, and so they're used in that way. Um, so absolutely, I think how crises are used um, which is why I think it takes even more effort on um, the people's part to um, organize and agitate against that. Um, and my hope, and I'm not gonna hold my breath for this, my hope is that intellectuals and academics can find themselves on the side of those agitations and say, how can I amplify those rather than dismiss them or just use them for my theory and my professional advancement, right? Um, but our job should really be to amplify as much as we can. Um, your second question was about, um, sorry. Yeah, about this notion of herd immunity being used uh, by people in part like saying that things will be well once we get herd immunity. Is this shifting? Sorry, there's a lot of people. Uh, is this just shifting of responsibility onto the patient? Yes, I think so. I mean, I think it's also a way of saying, sorry, there's nothing we can do until everyone becomes immune. Um, I mean, the best way to achieve herd immunity is through a vaccine program. Unfortunately, we have like, you know, big pharma producing vaccines. Um, and so we're not going to get the vaccines to everyone. But um, yes, it's absolutely a way of absolving oneself of blame. Again, I think here, it's very instructive to compare like, the response in Kerala to the response somewhere else. Um, and they didn't wait for herd immunity, but yet their mortality rate was much, much lower. Um, and there's more about this in that presentation on Thursday. Um, so there were plenty of things governments could have done, but talking about herd immunity was just, as you said, a way of displacing and absolving oneself of the responsibility to do anything. Um, and, you know, as I said, it's it, just making the whole thing seem like a natural disaster. Uh, to which we're just all equally victims. And it wasn't a natural disaster at all. There was a lot we did to amplify COVID um, and to get, breathe life into it. Um, and nobody wanted to take responsibility for that. Uh, if I may, uh, one more question. This notion of illness, something beyond the normal, right? So this is uh, primarily extended onto Individual humans. Is, is, does it make sense to extend this notion to institutions rather than just individuals? Hmm. Um, do you mean by saying, like, do you mean to say the World Bank is sick? <laughs> is that what you mean? Or do you mean? I mean, a World Bank, they could, like, uh, attribute these institutions as probably viruses or bacteria or something like that. I mean, yeah. Oh. I mean, it could be a powerful rhetorical strategy, um, I think. Um, I, I haven't seen it done effectively, but yes, I, I mean, I think I have seen people talk about the sort of investor class as parasites on the system, right? I mean, no other group of people can just sit and watch their money make money. Um, it's quite a parasitic kind of relationship to have to society. Um, so that's that's an extension, a rhetorical extension. Um, I, I should also just say, you know, before I was a historian, I went to medical school and the only thing, I mean, one of the main things I remember from medical school was that we learned very quickly um, that socioeconomic status is the number one predictor of health. I mean, and of course, all the medical educators said that, but then we never actually, the curriculum was not built around that fact at all. Um, and so I think a lot of medical experts are trained to deal with individual cases of illness and not look at the larger structural forces that cause illness. Um, so in that, in that way, the medical system is also complicit in producing illness in that way, right? Um, but 
lots of people know that inequality, poverty um, is, is the breeding ground for illness. Um, and like most problems in the world, lots of people know what the solution is. We just keep going as if we don't know, you know. But that's an interesting question. I, I, I would love to see it done well, frankly. If anyone else has a question to ask, this is your moment. Yeah, well, I think uh, this was a wonderful session. And I really love this conversation with style. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shifu, for your amazing insight. Uh, just a brief summary for people who are still here. Uh, this session essentially discussed the role of power and collusion uh, in creating this notion of a crisis, especially a health crisis, and that it is uh, a bit problematic to lay all the blame on state institutions when historically market has done a lot in determining where uh, what, what illnesses are considered uh, something uh, outside the normal as a crisis, while others are slightly are ignored into everyday banality, which might cause even more deaths over a longer period of time. We discuss power structures in academic, especially economic paradigms, in helping to obfuscate reality notions of understanding what should we value, what is to be valued in our ex everyday uh, existence. Um, we discussed, uh, Dr. Sheetal discussed the aftermath of COVID, uh, of how essentially this idea of poverty is not just limited to the global south, but it exists in the global north. It's just that there's a discrepancy in the extent of it. This idea that how there has been profiteering during the pandemic wherein a certain class of people have doubled their income while others have lost even more. Uh, and for this, I thank you and I thank all the attendants. Uh, before we end here, uh, I just was some brief announcements. Uh, we do have another more sessions on this theme of political and economic impacts of COVID-19. Uh, especially one later to, uh, tonight as per Indian time by Dr. Alessandro Samanego and Montoya, who would speak on women in the face of COVID-19 crisis. This, the, an English translation to this would be available later on RE India's YouTube page. Uh, you can join me again tomorrow with Dr. Subhi Kesar, who would actually take on to discuss the impact of pandemic on formal and informal workers. Uh, I would uh, request Elizabeth to uh, put out the links for Dr. Sheetal's publications, uh, which tie up with the discussion today uh, that happened right now. Uh, you can uh, you can uh, follow up on her work on Dr. Uh, Survey's uh, faculty page at Connecticut College. She is also uh, available on social media websites like Twitter. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Sheetal, very, very much for coming here. It was an absolute pleasure to have you speak and engage with you. Uh, thank you to the audience for joining us here, being very patient for your questions and answers. See you soon uh, in other RE events. Take care. Goodbye.